everyone. It's great to have you here today. Are you guys ready to worship the Lord? In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come and gather together to lift up the name, call on the Savior, fall on your grace. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name to be here this morning, that we worship a God who saves today. Amen. Let me read a psalm here for you. Psalm 
Psalm 98 says this. We'll sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with a lyre, with a lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. This is a place where of joy this morning. When we come and gather together and we sing praises, there's no sad faces. This is a place where God speaks to us and we have the privilege to, to give shouts of joy to him because of what he's done. His right arm is strong. He brings salvation to us. Man, it's such a privilege to worship God this morning, isn't it? Lord, we thank you that you are a God who saves. Lord, we can, we can give you praise this morning because several of us here, Lord, have experienced salvation, your saving right hand in our lives. And so, Lord, we want to give our praise back to you because you are worthy of it. And so, Lord, I pray that we would not hold back this morning, but we would give you our whole heart, our, our full devotion to you, God, that we would be joyful in our songs to you this morning. God, receive our praise. Be honored in it. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. 
shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these folks will sing. Great are you, Lord. Sing your praise to the Lord's voice. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these folks will sing. Destined to die, poured out for all mankind. God's only Son, perfect and spotless one. He never sinned, suffered as if he did. All the
the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. see the chorus here on the screen here. It says, Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes and wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Those are some great words and we sing to God who's holy, holy, holy. There's no one like him. There's no one no one besides him. He's matchless in power and worth. He's worthy of our praise this morning. And he's so good to us. Amen. So we're asking him, Lord, this morning, would you show us your glory? May we experience your presence. May we see your glory. And God, may we humble ourselves this morning. God, change us. Change our hearts. Make us more responsive to you today. Responsive to your word. May we not come away from this morning, God, the same people. May we have hearts that are passionate for you and passionate to see the lost saved. You're worthy of our praise today. We love you. song we could ever see 
worthy of all the praise we could ever breathe. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus' name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes and wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart. Love to those around me. 
thank you this morning that we have been able to worship you today through song. Lord, I thank you that you're a God who can be trusted. You're a God who we put our hope in this morning. May you have your way in our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. So glad you guys could join us today, and uh, we're going to go ahead and dismiss Disciple City, so kindergarten through fifth, you guys can head out. And why don't you take some time and greet one another? So you'll notice um, the, uh, the cross is lit today, and uh, yeah, so we wanted to kind of share with you a little bit about that this morning, and so uh, we're going to start with Carolyn and Louie, and uh, for those of you that don't know the Robinsons, uh, quite a journey that, no, I'll give that to you now, that God has had them on, uh, it was, uh, I think you said 14 months ago about that? Yeah. When I uh, got a call from Carolyn saying that uh, she had leukemia. And uh, so we uh, asked you all to pray. And uh, she ended up going in to just see how extensive it was. And the doctor said, you don't have leukemia. Yeah. So uh, God did some big stuff then. And uh, she just recently went in for a checkup. And what's the results of the latest test? The latest test are I am still leukemia free. I don't have any. I don't have any cancer in my body. But I don't know. Um, and it's been wonderful. I go in every six weeks and get um, a scan. Every month I get blood work to make sure my levels are right. They're supposed to be, and they are. So we're glad to hear that. I really appreciate all the prayers. Amen. And so this week, uh, your father, yeah. who you said is sixty-one, something yeah. like that. He's uh, real sick. He has, yeah. he has cancer himself, and yeah. he's never been one to go to church, yeah. or he doesn't know the Lord, and yeah. this week you had a chance to talk to him. Um, I was talking to him, and I said, Dad, do you believe in Jesus? He kind of hesitated and says, he says, yeah, why? Well, I said, do you, do you, know, you do know that Jesus died on the cross for us so we can go into the kingdom of heaven. And he to wash away our sins. And he got quiet. He said, He said, Will you save me? Will you were here pray with me. I said, oh, So he yeah. wanted you to pray with him? Yeah. yeah. 61 years. My father has never asked me to pray with him. Nothing. You make your prayer, you run the other way. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> Louis said, he, You mentioned prayer, he runs the other way. And so he asked you to pray for him. Yeah. And you prayed with him, and he asked Jesus to be his Savior. And he asked Jesus to be his Savior, which I cried. Oh, yeah. Well, you should have cried. <laughs> you should have cried. And how does that make you feel as his daughter to know that even though he's had a hard heart all these years, now he's going to be in heaven someday? Very grateful. Yeah, very I'm grateful. So grateful to Amen. God and Amen. Jesus and for everything that he's done to me Amen. and for me. Carolyn, I just want to say that, you know what, God used you in his life. And by you telling him about Jesus, he's on his way to heaven now. And so, you know, let that bless your heart today, too. Amen, you guys? Isn't that awesome? Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay, come on over here. Where where'd, uh, my friend Kaylee end up? Is she out there somewhere? Kaylee, come on up here. You're next. So, here, this is Bridget and... and um, Bridget came to our membership class last Sunday. You've been coming here, you said, almost a year, something like that, something like that, quite a while. And uh, so uh, after the class, Bridget says, uh, can we talk for a couple minutes? I said, sure. And so she came into my office, and, you know, there's a difference between knowing about the Lord and moving that from your head to your heart. When it's up here, it's all about you do what people tell you to do. It's, it's like you do, 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 or don't, 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 and it's like religion. But 
when you move beyond religion and you realize, I tried all that and it didn't work and I'm still in need of Jesus, then you realize you need Jesus personally as your Lord and Savior, right? Okay, so share, build on that now, share your story. So I grew up in church since I, um, my parents, my mother brought me when I was very young and um, I was baptized, I was in my early 20s. Um, if you ask me heaven, hell, I know. I mean, I know there is, I know there's a God. I, I thought that I was saved. I didn't want to go to hell. I um, was baptized and continued to live my life like I wanted to live my life. Didn't really understand, I guess, or, or it was emotional, but it wasn't, it didn't stay with me. And for about two years, um, we had started going into a place in West Des Moines at Grace West. And I feel like I'm too loud. Just bring, they're turning okay. you up, so bring it down and they'll okay. turn it down. There you okay. go. Okay. And so um, I just had it for about two years, this nagging feeling. I thought it was just the devil, you know, just making me doubt what was going on in my life. And thinking about just what I felt about what had went on the years since I had professed my faith. And I, I hadn't even told my husband or family, you know, because I thought I was saved. And again, this every week, you know, I, I can come and sing and I know it here, but I didn't know it here. I really know it here. And so when uh, Pastor Rob was reading and I told him, I don't even know exactly what it was when it was revealed to me, I wasn't saved because I had not truly surrendered my life, my heart, myself to Christ. And it was amazing. It just, there's a difference. So there's we talked a difference about when that, it goes from here to here. And you said, okay, I need to take care of this. I needed to take care of it. So you bow it. your head. Yeah. And, and, and it poured out. You were out. shedding tears. Yeah, I, mean, I cried. It just poured out. Now I know I'm saved. And there's Amen. no question. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> then you were crying because you yeah, were happy. happy. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was awesome. Very much. Yeah. And, and Bridget, this cross is lit in part at least because of you today, because yep. you invited Christ to be your Savior. Yeah. And we're rejoicing with the angels in heaven today. Amen? Yes. Amen. Yes. God bless you, Bridget. <laughs> All right. Thanks for sharing. Freed up financial living. Sometimes a person has to wonder whether there even is such a thing. And that may be what you're thinking right now. But being freed up financially can be a reality, and the means of achieving that reality are not as difficult or complex as we tend to believe. I'm Dick Towner, Executive Director of the Good Sense Movement and author of the Freed Up Financial Living Curriculum. I've spent the majority of my lifetime trying to help people get it right in this financial area of their lives. And I'm happy to report that many have done so, including some who thought it was totally impossible. Being financially freed up is doable for all of us, regardless of where we fall along the financial continuum. Freed up financial living is about a whole lot more than just money. It deals with some of the most profound aspects of one's personal and spiritual life. So buckle your seat belts, listen carefully, Work hard on the exercises and activities and know that God will be pleased with your efforts. As Philippians 4.13 states, you can do it. You can do all things through him who strengthens you. Okay, as I promised, we are going to offer this on Wednesday nights beginning in March. You do have an insert that talks about this today. And uh, if you would like to be a part of our Freed Up Financial Living Group, uh, which will meet on Wednesday evenings in the month of March, um, on the back of your connection card, let us know. We'll make sure we get a workbook for you. And we just want to make sure we have enough. Now, we put that information on this insert, not so much for you because you see it here, but uh, anybody that... Anybody that can come to this class, so it doesn't have to be a member or a tender of fellowship. So if you know somebody that would benefit from it, take this and give it to them and invite them uh, to come out. I think it will be extremely, extremely 
um, helpful. With that, let's take our connection cards at this time. Looks like this right here. And uh, go ahead and take a minute and fill it out. When I get done speaking in a little while, you can drop these in our offering bags. On the back, there is that box about freed up living. There's also a box about our Wednesday night meal. We have a free meal here every Wednesday night at 530. And if you are planning on being here, let us know how many are, are coming uh, on the back of your card so we can have enough uh, food ready for you. Now, last Sunday... Uh, we uh, talked to you about the Meals from the Heartland. We are joining the Churches of the Axe Network here in Norwalk, and we're packing 100,000 meals in, on Saturday, March the 4th. And uh, I wasn't sure about this, but when we threw this out to you last Sunday, uh, uh, all the packing slots got filled right after the 1030 service. So uh, thanks for signing up for that. We're glad you did, and I apologize for anybody that you wanted to get signed up and all the slots were gone. Um, we tried to secure some more this week, but we just, uh, they're all just taken right now. And uh, I'm, I'm happy about that, but I'm sorry for those that didn't quite get in. Um, there are some other non-packing slots if you'd like to serve, including uh, setting up on Friday. So stop out at the table, the Mills from the Heartland table. You can talk to them about that after the service. Inside your uh, worship folder this morning, there is an envelope that says Meals from the Heartland. And uh, so the meals are 20 cents a piece. Uh, 20 cents times 100,000 meals is $20,000, and we're splitting that among the churches. So our goal to raise is $6,666, and we've got to have that in hand by March 5th. And so if you would like to give toward that need uh, to pack these meals and pay for them, uh, just slip a gift in here. Uh, you don't have to give it to us today, but uh, we would need it by March 5th. And uh, you don't have to use this envelope if you don't want to. If you just want to use uh, the other means of giving that we have here, uh, you can do that. And so we're excited about that. Our memory verse this week. I want us to say this out loud. This is uh, our memory verse for this week. Let's say it together. Ready? Here we go. Everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a sensible man who built his house on the rock. Matthew 7, 24. And on your way out this morning, our ushers will have a card if that will help you to memorize that verse. I want you to know we do have a new uh, memory verse board that's out in the Grand Central uh, lobby there. It's got all these verses on it, so there's multiple copies, so you can get one. There's some articles about uh, memorizing God's Word when you have a busy lifestyle and some things that might encourage you. So I would encourage you to stop out and take a look at that board. Let's go to Acts chapter 17 this morning. Acts chapter 17, and uh, pull your notes out, if you would, please. That's our outline for today. And uh, I was taken back by a line of words from that one, the last song we sang. I wrote it down. The words go like this. Lead me in love to those around me. That's what we sang today. Lead me in love to those around me. That's what I want to talk about today. From Acts chapter 17. Would you join me in prayer? We're going to pray for Mike Freeze. Mike's a member of our church. Found out last night he was having some trouble breathing. And so he's in the ICU at Mercy Hospital. And so if you would be in prayer for Mike, I know he and his wife Marlene would appreciate that. And so let's go ahead and pray for Mike right now. God, thank you for uh, Mike and Marlene Freeze, Lord. And, and God, I'm sure Mike didn't intend on ending in the hospital. And yet here he is today. And we pray, God, that you would strengthen his lungs and his body, that his breathing would, would get better, Lord, and his body would get stronger. Lord, if there's decisions that he and Marlene need to make together, God, I pray that you give him wisdom to make your decisions. Father, I pray today that they would feel your grace and strength undergirding them because we are praying for them. And so, Lord, hear our prayers. Touch Mike. Give him the strength that he needs. Touch Marlene. Give her the strength that she needs to come alongside her husband and to encourage him. And so we thank you for the Freeze family and for our time together in the Word today. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. The greatest gift of all is the gift of eternal life, salvation by faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? That is the greatest gift of all. Because salvation is the greatest gift of all, 
It's also the greatest message that we, any of us, all of us, can share. Nothing is greater and more important. And yet, and yet, it's very common for all of us to feel frustrated when it comes to sharing the gospel with others. Have you ever been in a situation where you felt that the Lord was just moving you to tell someone about the Lord Jesus Christ and how to be saved? Now, if you're a Christian, all of us have at one point or another. The question I have for you is, what happened? What did you do about it? Or let's say uh, you're in a situation, you're with a friend. And that friend just out of the blue asked you about religious matters or your faith. What did you say? Or perhaps you have a family member. They needed to hear the gospel desperately. And you finally got a time to be alone with them. You had the opportunity to share the gospel with that family member. What happened? If you're like me, you want to be able to say that every time that I've been in a situation like that, I responded, I, I, I did what the Lord led me to do, and that's all that happened. I wish I could say that I'd always done that. I wish I could say that. I still can remember the first time, the first time that happened to me as I'm standing in the hallway in middle school in eighth grade, and um, this kid, I don't even remember his name, and we're standing outside the lockers, and he said something about not sure about his life after he died. You know, as I'm standing there, I, I can still picture that hallway, and in my mind, being pushed by the Holy Spirit to say something, because I knew the answer to what he was talking about. In fact, I'd already led my neighbor friend to the Lord the year before. So I knew the verses, I knew what I should say. And for whatever reason that day, I don't know if it was the influence of the surroundings, whatever it might be, here these many years later, I still remember the fact that I didn't say anything, even though I knew the truth. For the vast majority of Christians, the reason we don't share the gospel isn't because we don't believe it. We do. That's why we're Christians. We believe it. Most of the time, the reason is because we just, we're just not prepared. We're not ready to share the gospel with others. And yet, when we come to Acts chapter 16 today, we see the Apostle Paul, and he's witnessing. He's witnessing to the people of Athens. And the reason that he's doing, he did what he did is because he was ready. And being ready to be a witness for Jesus Christ is absolutely imperative for us as followers of Jesus. We've got to be ready. In fact, look what the scripture says. 1 Peter 3.15, always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason of the hope that is in you. Always be ready. I'm always to be ready to talk to someone about Jesus. Always. Well, this morning, using the example of the Apostle Paul here in Acts 17, I want to not only challenge you, to hopefully uh, have a passion to do this, but hopefully in a little way better equip you to be ready to give a defense of your faith and a presentation of the gospel because that's the only thing that's going to save people from their sins. There's only Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. If what Jesus said is true, then salvation in Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. If we believe that here, say amen. amen. We do believe that. Therefore, we need to be ready to share it. So, we're in Acts. We've kind of taken a break for the last few weeks, but we're back to Acts, and we're going verse by verse through it, and we're in chapter 17. We're in the last half of the book. We've seen that Paul uh, and some companions are going around the world at different times, starting churches, sharing the gospel. And there's three of these, uh, I call them expeditions. Expeditions to share the gospel. Some people, many people call them missionary journeys, and that's what they were. Um, the, here in Acts chapter 17, we're on the tail end of the second missionary journey. Uh, next week we'll complete it, or in a couple of weeks we'll complete it, when we uh, look when Paul started a church in Corinth, in the city of Corinth. That's pretty much the end of the second missionary journey. Uh, let me show you the map where he's been so far. This is a map of just the second missionary journey, about midway through the first century. They all started in their home church, uh, Antioch Community Church, as I call it. That's where they started. And uh, they went all the way across Asia Minor, and they ended up in, um, 
uh, Philippi and Berea. God did some great things there, Thessalonica. Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, and uh, Paul today ends up in Athens. Now, Paul and his missionary team had seen God do some great things back in Berea and then the city before that in Thessalonica. Lots of people got saved. I, I believe, it didn't, say, it didn't say this word for word, but I believe churches were established there because there were so many believers. Um, but they also had come across a lot of opposition, a lot of angry mobs of people, and, and Paul had to leave. He had to leave uh, Thessalonica, he had to leave Berea, and some of his companions said, look, Paul, we got to get you out of here. They're going to kill you, man. And so they loaded up Paul on a ship, and they took him to the city of Athens. And here's uh, where that happened, by the way, leading up to our passage today. In Acts chapter 17, would you watch verse 14 and 15? It says, Then, then the brothers immediately sent Paul away to go to the sea, but Silas and Timothy stayed on there. And those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens. And after receiving instructions for Silas and Timothy to come to him as quickly as possible, they departed. So here's Paul. His team's back in Berea, which means he's all by himself in this great big city of about 10,000 people in Athens, Greece, waiting for his teammates to catch up to him. Now, this seems like a good time for Paul to, to take a breather, take a break, right? But after two missionary journeys now, we've seen what the Apostle Paul is like. Does Paul ever take a break? All right, Does he ever, uh, you know, take a nap or take it easy? He doesn't do that. He can't. He's so impassioned was sharing the gospel. Well, here in Athens, Paul faithfully takes the opportunity to do some witnessing. And there's a lot of people in Athens that need to hear the gospel. Now, Paul's a great example for us of someone who took his faith seriously and he made it a priority to obey the last command that Jesus gave before he went back up into heaven. What was the very last command Jesus gave before he went back up into heaven? Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my what, did Jesus say? What's it say? Witnesses. You will be my witnesses. Now this verse, I know it's familiar. We've looked at it many times because it's the theme verse for the whole book of Acts. Uh, and, and so we've looked at that. But it's more than just a prediction of what the church would do throughout the book of Acts and on into the future to today. This was Jesus' last wishes his last command before he returned back to heaven. He left his disciples here and every generation of disciples since then. We're a generation of disciples. We're the latest generation of disciples. We follow in generations before us all the way back to the first century. He left us here to make disciples, to make sure that the world knew that God loves them. And he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for their sins. And Jesus rose again. He is the Messiah. That's the message of the gospel. And he left us here to proclaim that message. This is our highest priority as followers of Jesus. It is our mandate. It is our calling. It is our marching orders, our purpose, our reason for existence as a church is to make sure the world knows there is a Savior. His name is Jesus. Amen? That's why we're here. That's why our mission says joining God's mission to disciple all peoples for the sake of his name. That's not just the mission of Fellowship Community Church. That's Jesus' mission. Every church ought to have a mission just like this one because it's the mission that God left for us. Now, <clears throat> every person who comes to faith in Christ is to be a witness about Jesus. And yet, in spite of this unequivocal importance, the importance of sharing the gospel... Um, most of us, let's be honest, okay, if we were to sit down in little, little groups and talk, we'd, if we were all honest with one another, not putting up smoke screens and, and things like that, we'd say, you know, most of us feel somewhat maybe incompetent, maybe unprepared to witness. Frankly, we feel a little guilty that we haven't been as faithful maybe as we feel God would want us to, if we were honest, okay, starting with me. Now, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, excuses or reasons why Christians um, give for why they feel that way, why they feel guilty. I want to show you some of the reasons Christians give for not being faithful in sharing the gospel and just give a brief comment on each one. The first one is this. A lot of Christians say, well, I'm not a good witness or I can't witness because I'm not smart enough. Okay, and that's an interesting, that's an interesting um, 
uh, reason because uh, you would think if anybody would, would have been able to have that reason, it would have been Jesus' followers. But one day, Peter and John were out there sharing the gospel, and they were arrested and brought together before the, the authorities. And here's what they said. They said, now when we saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. You don't have to have college degrees or be at the top of your class to be a witness for Jesus Christ. You know what matters most is that you know Jesus. If you know Jesus, that qualifies you to tell others about him. Amen? You know him, you got all you need. Okay? Here's another one people say, well, I don't want to make anybody mad. Okay, I respect that one. Uh, that's understandable. You shouldn't set out to make people mad. There are some Christians like that. that It's like they want to get in an argument with everybody. It's like they're out to make people mad. People like that, I just want to knock them upside the head. Okay? You're not out to make people mad. In fact, the Bible says, live at peace with everyone as much as possible. So we should try to live at peace. If, if, if there's something offensive about the witnessing process, it should be the message, not us. Sometimes the message is an affront to people. Sometimes it is offensive to people. But let it be the message that offends people, not us. Amen? Let it be the message. Jesus... I mean, Jesus, you know, he, I love, I love Jesus' ministry because people knew he cared. He cared about people. He, hurting people hurt him. And people saw that. Look at that verse there. When he saw the crowds, Jesus had compassion for them because they were weary and worn out like sheep without a shepherd. I mean, Jesus had compassion on people, yet he shared a message that sometimes was hard. And sometimes, especially the religious people, they got mad at him. But they weren't mad at him, they were mad at the message. So as much as possible, let's, let's, let's try to love people. And if there's going to be any offense in the process, let them be offended with the message of the gospel, not with us. Third, my friends will make fun of me. That's why I don't share. Now here's something to think about. We often, I think, turn this fear into maybe this monster in our lives when it really shouldn't be. You'd be surprised how often people will respect you if you're upfront about your beliefs. They may not agree. Many won't agree. But they'll respect you. They, they might not understand why when there's a party and everybody's drinking, you're not. They may not understand why everybody's talking about dirty jokes and you refuse to laugh or to share one. They may not understand why you want to go to youth group every Sunday night and all their other friends don't want to. But people often find genuine faith, genuine faith, pretty interesting. They may not understand it all. But they find it interesting. And many people will even respect you for your strong convictions. In fact, when we try to be our best and live our best and act like Jesus, here's what the Bible says. Be blameless and pure, children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation among whom you shine like the stars. When you let Jesus live through you, your life's going to be different than the people around you. It's going to be like a shining star in a dark sky. Amen? Amen? I don't know how many people I've talked to in this church who said, you know what, some of the people that I work with or some of my friends at school, they think I'm stupid because I'm a Christian. They think it's stupid that I go to all this stuff and am so involved in all that stuff. But interestingly enough, when they want somebody to pray for them, who do they go to? That's right. They know who. They know who to go to. Let's be those people who they go to when they have a need. Amen? Here's another reason people give. Number four, none of my Christian friends witness. Nobody's doing it. If you ever talk to your friends why they don't witness, chances are they'll give you some of these reasons right here. Maybe what they need is for someone to show them that this is doable. Maybe they need someone to encourage them, to lead the way, to be that example. Could I ask you, couldn't you be that person? Couldn't you be the person that others could say, oh, okay, that's how you do that. Couldn't you be the one? How about this one? I'm not a very good Christian. Well, I appreciate the honesty, uh, but I don't know a perfect Christian around, do you? I wish I did, but I don't know a perfect Christian. 
Maybe you don't pray as often as you'd like. Maybe you don't read the, your Bible as often as you think you should. Maybe sometimes you sin. So why should you tell others about Jesus if you aren't living it? That's the mindset. That's the mindset of this number five. Fortunately, being a believer isn't about being perfect. Hey, by the way, I'm grateful for that, aren't you? I'm grateful that being a Christian doesn't mean you're perfect because you, you can't be perfect. It's about God's love and God's forgiveness in our lives. It's about his saving grace. So does this mean because of God's grace that I get to do what I want? No, it doesn't mean that. God wants you to become more like him every single day, but he can also use us even though sometimes we mess up. He can still use us. We don't have to be perfect to share the gospel. We just have to be faithful to share it. So if you feel this morning that, well, I'm not a very good Christian, okay? Why do you feel that way? Maybe there's some things in your life that you need to square away between you and the Lord. If I could encourage you this morning, do it. Don't put it off. Square things away with God so you can be someone that others will look to as a faithful witness for Jesus. Some people say, number six, uh, all my friends are Christians. And I know that can be a problem. The longer you're a follower of Jesus, it seems like, and, and what I've seen in many, many years of ministry, the longer we're, we're followers of Jesus, the less unsaved friends we have. That is a challenge. But the command of Jesus from Matthew 20, 18 still stands. Okay, go. Go. Go and make disciples. And so if that's a problem, maybe we need to ask God this morning, God, could you bring some, bring some non-Christians into my life? And God, use me to invest in them so they'll come to know you as Lord and Savior. Number seven is this. I don't even know where to start. I understand that one too. Can I just encourage you? Why not start right here where we are? Okay? We're doing a Bible study this morning in Acts 17. Why not start right here and ask the Lord to show you during this study this morning what you have to do to start being a faithful witness for Jesus Christ? I'm going to pray about that in a moment, but I want to give you number eight first. I feel unprepared in being able to share the gospel. I get that too. I understand that. And so that's why this Wednesday night we're going to do what we call sharing the gospel. You can do it. I'm going to share with you a plan, the verses that you need to know to share the gospel with somebody else. Nobody after this Wednesday will be able to say, I feel unprepared. I just took a group of deacons through this last week. We'll be taking the Mexico team through it this afternoon. And we're going to open this up to anybody who wants to come Wednesday night. There's no reason why any child of God in this church should say, I'm unprepared to share the gospel. We're going to provide this for you. Come Wednesday night. It'll really, really help you. So with that, that completes my introduction. Now we're going to get into Bible study. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we take these things to heart, these reasons why sometimes I have used for not sharing the gospel, not witnessing, and others have used. But Lord, today I pray that our study of Acts and what we get out of it today will blast all those out of the water. Lord, if there's some of us here that we just need to know where to start, then show us, God. Speak to our hearts and show us where you would have us start. God, if there's some of us in this room that we just need some people in our lives that we can invest in, people who don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, then God, I pray that you'll hear those prayers today and bring those people into our lives this week and really, really soon. God, I pray that you would give us the heart for the Apostle Paul and most of all the heart for Jesus. You left us with marching orders, Jesus. You said you will be my witnesses. God, I pray that we will be a church of witnesses to this world. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we come to Acts 17. Paul is in Athens, and he's going to share the gospel with them, and we can learn a lot. I'm going to ask you today 
to look at Paul's example and follow his example in how he shared the gospel with complete strangers, with people who were steeped in idolatry, and he shared the gospel with them. I want us to get the background of this setting. And so on your notes this morning, if you look at your notes today, this is what it was like in Athens, Greece, 2,000 years ago. Here's what it was like. In its heyday, several centuries before Christ, Athens had been the greatest city in the world. Some of the greatest philosophers of all time taught there. Socrates, his brilliant student Plato, and Plato's student Aristotle. Athens was a religious center where almost every god in existence was worshipped. Statues of gods of all kinds filled the city. Away from the city center, high on a hill of rock, stood the Areopagus, also called Mars Hill, where councils and courts would convene. In Paul's time, the Areopagus was apparently also used as a place for philosophical debates and speeches away from the noise and the bustle of downtown Athens. Almost 300 years before this, the philosophies of Stoicism and Epicureanism were founded. The term Stoic came from the Greek stoi, meaning a porch or portico. Zeno, the, father, the, fa- the founder of the Stoics, held his school in a porch in the city of Athens. Stoics practiced indifference to both pain and pleasure living minimalist and disciplined lives. They also believed in one God who is experienced in nature. Epicureans were named after their founder, Epicurus. Epicureans accepted both pleasure and pain as part of life, but they sought to reduce pain and to enhance pleasure. However, original and genuine Epicureans did not do so by excess or hedonistic addiction. Epicureans valued the more honorable pleasures, such as harmonious friendships. They acknowledged all gods, but did not think They influenced human life in any important way or that humans should become emboldened to them. Now, let's read the text here in the first section, and you'll see these terms used. Now you know what they mean. Verse 16, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was troubled within him when he saw the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with those who worshiped God and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. And then also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers argued with him. Some said, why is this pseudo-intellectual trying to say? Others replied, he seems to be a preacher of foreign deities because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to the Areopagus and they said, may we learn about this new teaching you're speaking of? For what you are saying sounds strange to us and we want to know Uh, what these things, these ideas mean. Now all the uh, Athenians and the foreigners residing there spent their time in nothing else but telling or hearing something new. It is into this world in Athens in chapter 17 that Paul stepped off the boat on the pier in Athens, a world of idols and idol worship, people sitting around debating philosophy under the sun all day long. And frankly, Frankly, it made, it made Paul angry, verse 16 says, and I'll get back to that in a moment. But verse 17 says that Paul did what he normally did, okay? What is, in every city, what did Paul always do first? He always went to the Jewish synagogue. That's where he started. He started preaching the gospel in the synagogue. And verse 17 says, then he went out into the marketplace and began to tell the gospel to the people in the marketplace. Now, the, in the marketplace... The city marketplace in Athens was called the Agora, A-G-O-R-A, the Agora. The Agora was acres wide and acres long. It it was filled with businesses and temples and government buildings where everyone would come and buy and sell and trade and hear the uh, the latest news. It was basically the Athens version of Jordan Creek Mall. If you get that, shake your head, okay? Jordan Creek Mall. This was, the, this was the Jordan Creek Mall of the city of Athens. The Agora was a people magnet. And that's why Paul went there, to share the gospel with anyone he could get to listen to him. And he did that, and that's when he ran into these philosophers, these Stoic and these Epicurean philosophers. And some of them even got in an argument with him. But others were intrigued by what he said, especially when he was talking about some guy who died and had come back to life again. That really tripped their trigger. So they invited Paul to go to this hill, the top of this hill, and on top of this hill was this place where the philosophers would gather to debate, and they would sit around and talk all day long, argue back and forth. 
and they invited him to this place called the Areopagus. Now, if you look at these pictures behind me, these, this would be almost exactly what it would have been like for Paul when he stepped off the boat in Athens Harbor. Over on the hill was this massive temple that was built centuries before Paul, the Parthenon, centuries before Paul was even there. Guys, listen, his eyes saw that. It's still there today. Okay, go to Athens, Greece. It's still there. Paul saw that. And then you have a lot of the arenas that were there. And then this is what people believe is where the Areopagus was. Now it's just a big rock. But at one point on top of this place was a place where people would go and debate the, the latest philosophies and talk about all the gods and why this person and why that one's the best. And they would sit around and that's all they would talk about. They invited Paul to come and stand in the middle of everyone and see how long he could keep their attention by his philosophical arguments. Now we know that Paul's arguments were not his personally. He's going to share the gospel. Okay, And so Paul has this golden opportunity that he could never dream of. He has been given an audience at the Areopagus in the, on the hill outside Athens, Greece. But if he was going to get anywhere, he's going to have to be very careful. Okay, Because if he, if he said anything that, that, that didn't build on it, if it wasn't presented in a, a sound reasoning kind of way, they would remove him instantly. So Paul's got to be careful what he says or he'll be kicked out. But he's got to share the gospel. And so what we see here today is what Paul said in this next section. What he said, I want you to take note. Because we can learn from this. We can learn how to share the gospel the way Paul did. Maybe not identically, but he leaves a good model for us. Sharing the gospel includes, according to Paul's model, several things. Number one, write this down. It includes possessing a holy and jealous passion for the glory of God. A holy and jealous passion for the glory of God. Would you look at verse 16 again? And I know we're up to verse 22, but look at verse 16 again because this, this hits at home. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was troubled within him when he saw that, his, that the city was full of idols. Okay, guys, listen. First thing you do. Before you share the gospel, before you get it all up here, before you come Wednesday night and I'll show you how to share the gospel, but before you get it in your head, there's something that has to be here. Paul got off that boat and he looked around and he saw hundreds of idols and statues and sacrificial places. And did you see verse 16? It said... His spirit was troubled within him. You know what that means? It means he got angry. He got angry. But he wasn't mad at the people. Un, unrighteous people do those things. He wasn't mad at them. He was mad at the fact that there's only one God who deserves the worship and the glory of the people of the world. It's the God of heaven. Not the God of stone, not the God of wood, not the God of carvings. God wasn't receiving the glory that is due his name, and it made Paul mad. And you know, you know what he did? And you know what he did with that anger? He turned it toward witnessing. He took his displeasure with the false gods of the, and the deities of Athens, and he went about and shared the gospel everywhere he went, day after day after day, sharing the gospel. And if we're gonna share Jesus Christ faithfully, then we've got to start with us. It's got to be right here, a passionate, a passionate love for the glory of God, that we want to see the glory of God fill Norwalk in central Iowa, that people will come to know God through his son Jesus Christ because he deserves the glory, he deserves the honor, he deserves the worship, not this world, amen? He deserves it, and he's not getting it. By anybody who's not a follower of Jesus, he's not getting the glory that is due his name. And so if we want to see Jesus glorified in Norwalk in central Iowa to receive the glory that is due his name, let's get off our keisters and let's share the gospel with people. Because that's what the Apostle Paul did, amen? Keister, is that a word in the Bible? I just checked that out there. I'm not sure I read that in there. You get the idea, right? That's what Paul did. He acted on that passion. He started sharing the gospel. 
So I'm asking God today that he would put within my heart and within your heart a fresh passion for the glory of God in Norwalk and Central Iowa, a glory that moves us to share the gospel of Jesus. And then, number two, sharing the gospel includes finding common ground. Finding common ground. Now we move to verse 22. Then Paul stood in the middle of the Areopagus and he said, Men of Athens, I see that you are extremely religious in every respect. Whereas I was passing through and observing the objects of your worship, I even found an altar on which was inscribed to an unknown God. So what did Paul do? He's finding common ground. He looked through the culture of Athens. He used it. He said, look, what can I, what can I do to get on the same page with these people? How can I build common ground with these people? We have nothing in common. They, they all worship false gods. I worship the God of heaven. It seems like we have nothing in common. Where's our common ground? And as he's walking around the city of Athens, he comes across this stone sitting there somewhere in the city. All the other gods, there's the sun god and the moon god and the fertility goddess, all these hundreds of gods all throughout Athens. But this one was different. There was no name on it. All it said was, to an unknown God. When Paul saw that walking through the cities of Athens, he made a mental note of it. And as he stood in the middle of the Areopagus, he opens up his, he opens up his presentation of the gospel. And he says, hey, guys, you know, we got a lot in common here. We're religious people. In fact, I just saw a stone here in town. You guys have probably passed it hundreds of times. It says, to an unknown God. Right away, he had their attention. They were on the same page. They knew what he was talking about. And when you're sharing the gospel with somebody, don't just start, don't just start hitting them in the head with your Bible, right? Find common ground. Find common ground with them, something that interests them. Find out about their religious background. Do they have a religious background? Find something that you can build common ground with as a starting place to sharing the gospel. Then, number three, sharing the gospel includes using the familiar to introduce the unfamiliar. (laughs) Verse 23 continues, Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he is Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in shrines made by hands. So Paul says, look, you guys are familiar with this this rock that says to the unknown God. Hey, I'm here to tell you something, guys. I know that God. The unknown God to you, he's known to me. Let me tell you about him. Let me tell you about him. And so Paul is saying, listen, I want to connect with you even further. I want to share with you something that you already recognize, but you just don't know what it's about. To them, God was unknown. But Paul pointed out to them that indeed God was not, God was not knowable. You can know him. And they then proceeded how they could yet come to know this yet unknown God. So start with the familiar and then introduce the unfamiliar. Number four. Sharing the gospel includes being bold and clear about the message. That's on the back of your notes. It involves being bold and clear about the message. So look at verse 24. I'll start in verse 25. Neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. From one man he has made every nation of men to live all over the earth. And has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. So that they might seek God. Perhaps they might reach out to him and find him. Though he's not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist. Paul says, okay, we're on common ground now. We, let me, we're talking about familiar things. Let me tell you about this God that you don't think you could know. Let me tell you about him. And Paul told the Athenian people four things about God that were all contrary to what they already believed. Here's the first thing he told them about God. Number one, that God is the creator. You can't contain him. Athens was full of temples. Temples designed where you would go and worship the God of that temple. And Paul, and Paul said, listen, the God, that this unknown God, he's the creator of all. 
You can build the fanciest temple in the world, but it can't contain God. He's creator God. You can't contain him. He was blowing their philosophies out of the water. The second thing he said, he said, God is the originator of all, and therefore he has no needs. Listen, people bring sacrifices to their idols. They bring offerings to their gods. And Paul said, my God don't need offerings. My God don't need your sacrifices. He's the originator of all. He has no needs. There's nothing you can bring him that he needs. And then Paul said, thirdly, that he's all-knowing. God knows all. He's got a definite plan. Paul said he even knows where everybody lives. In fact, they live there because he wanted them to live there. God has a definite plan. Things are not just happenstance. Things don't just happen uh, because the moon aligns and all the stars align. No, God is an infinite God. He's got an infinite plan. And fourth, he said about God, number three, God is all-powerful. He's not dependent on anyone or anything. Listen, He's saying, he gave, hey guys, listen, the God, the unknown God, he's all powerful. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need you. He's independent of any of us. He's all powerful. And so Paul, Paul told them these things about God. And when we share the gospel with him, we have, with people, we have to communicate who God is. So people can come to understand him. That's why when we're sharing the gospel with somebody and we come to them, the very first verse that you share with somebody, Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That verse says everything about you and everything about God. We are sinners. God is not. He's holy God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The best person you know, the most righteous, the most moral, the the person that does the best things falls way short because they're not perfect and God is. You're telling that person all about God. That says a lot about who God is and that's what we want to do. We want to tell people about God. We want to be bold and clear about who, who God is, about that message. Fifth, sharing the gospel includes employing relevant examples. Relevant examples. So look at the last half of verse 28. It says, as even some of your own poets have said, and here's what they said, for we are also his offspring. Okay, so not only does Paul say, um, hey guys, I've been looking around your city. I found this, like, this, this rock over here, it says to an unknown God. And then Paul says, oh, by the way, one of your poets, here's what he said. And so Paul is, is using an example. They would have known exactly what that poet said and who said it. Paul pulled something out of their culture to try to connect with them. He employed relevant example so that they could uh, begin to understand the gospel. That's a great way to share the gospel, guys, is we use relevant examples. And Wednesday night when you're here, I'll share with you some good examples that you can use in sharing the gospel that will help you build common ground with the person that you're sharing the gospel with. Number six, applying the message personally. If we're going to share the gospel, we've got to share it personally. And it does get personal. Look at verse 29. Paul continues. Being God's God's offspring then, we shouldn't think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image fashioned by human art and imagination. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent because he has set... Okay, get this, okay? Verse 31, don't miss this. Because he has set a day on which he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. That's Jesus. He has, a, he has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Okay, Paul's getting real personal with the Athenian people. Paul made it clear that not only was God their creator, but most importantly, he's the judge of all. Paul said, a judgment day is coming. I'm just telling you, a judgment day is coming. Paul connected for them that a person's actions today have consequence for all of eternity. Has consequence for all of eternity. Why is that? Because what we do with Jesus in this life determines what God does with us in the life to come. Either we repent of our sins and accept Jesus as Lord and Savior and we go to heaven forever, or we deny Jesus, we reject him, we reject his offer of forgiveness and salvation, and God will allow us to pay our own price for our sin. And Romans 6.23 6.23 says the payment for sin is death. 
eternal separation from God in hell. So the message makes it personal. It's personal. What I do today impacts all of eternity. That's the end of Paul's message. He used these six three things. First, he had a a jealous passion for the glory of God. Then he found common ground. Then he used the familiar to introduce the unfamiliar. Then he was bold and clear about who Jesus is and the message of the gospel. And then he employed relevant examples. And then he applied the message personally. You better listen to this because the judgment day is coming, he said. When he got all done, what happened? Well, there were three different responses to the message. Look at verse 32. It says, when they heard this, When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some began to ridicule him. Okay, so here's the first response. Number one, some brazenly rejected it. Some just said, ah, not interested, I'm hitting the road. They weren't interested. They couldn't stomach a message that talked about somebody who died and rose again. They couldn't handle that. And this went went against everything that they believed in their philosophies. Let me tell you something, guys. Sometimes when we share the gospel with people, there are some people who are not going to accept it. It's going to seem far out. It's going to seem impossible. And they'll just flat out reject it. Now listen to me. When that happens, you can't take it personal. When that happens, you have to remember that our job is not to make people follow Jesus. Because we can't. The Bible says no one comes to the Father unless the Spirit draws them. You can't make someone become a Christian. To try is to be disobedient to the Lord. So when someone, doesn't, when someone hears the gospel and they reject it and they walk away, remember this. Our job is to be faithful to share the gospel, and we, re- and we leave the results to God himself. Amen? Be faithful to share it. Be faithful to share the gospel. That's all you got to do. So some people said, don't want it. They rejected it. There was another group of people, verse 32. But others said, we will, we will uh, hear you about this again. Some people said, Paul, that's an interesting message. You know what? Could we get together again and talk about that? We want to listen more. We want to hear more about what you have to say, Paul. Now, what did we learn from that? Okay, We learned that there will be people who don't shut you down. You shared the gospel with them. They didn't get mad at you. They didn't walk away. They just need more time to think about it. They need more time to investigate it and to check it out, the claims of Christ and the claims of the gospel. So give them time to do that. Don't be pushy. If the, Holy, the Holy Spirit's going to guide you. If you need to get them to think again, okay, get them to think again, but don't hit them over the head with your Bible. All right, don't, don't push them across the line. Let the Holy Spirit do that pushing. Let Him do that work in their hearts. There'll be some people who just say, you know what, okay, Let me just, I need time. Great, give them the time, okay? And then third, there will be people, some of the people here, they actually believed it and received it. Look at the next verses there. It says, so Paul uh, went out from their presence. However, however, some men joined him and believed. Among them were Dionysius, the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So Paul gets all done. He's done sharing. A group over here stands up and says, that is hogwash. I'm out of here. And they left. Another group over here said, whoa, Paul, that's interesting. Hey, could we talk more about this? Listen, why don't you come back next week? We'll hear you some more on this. And then there was another. And then Paul said, okay, no problem. I'm out. And he walked off the stage and out the door. But he wasn't alone. A number of people said, you know what? I want what Paul has. They believed and they received the message of eternal life. They were saved that day. And you know when, when you, what you do when that happens? You do things like light crosses 
and applaud and rejoice with the angels in heaven when things like that happen. Amen? That's what you do. That's what you do. Some people are going to reject it. Some people are going to say, let me think about it. And some people are going to be ready to believe it and receive it. So why is this important? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to land this plane. Okay, why is this important? Paul said over here, he said a day of judgment's coming. I want to show you where that is. Okay, turn your Bible to the last book of the Bible. Revelation chapter 20. You need to see this. Please look at Revelation chapter 20. Hey, Steve, could you turn me down some? Thanks. Revelation chapter 20, verse number 11. Watch or listen. Then I saw a great white throne and one seated on it. Earth and heaven fled his presence and no place was found for them. And I also saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works, what was written in the books. And then the sea gave up the dead, and death and Hades gave up their dead. All were judged according to their works. Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And anyone whose name was not written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Why should we witness? Why should we care whether our family members or our friends or our neighbors or coworkers don't know Christ? I want to answer that question with a question. A question that I'm asking God to stick in our minds every day this week. My question is simply this. Is there a hell? Is there a place created by God for Satan and the demons? A place of eternal suffering where they will spend eternity suffering, but also those who have not accepted Christ as their Savior, and they die in their sins. Is there a place? Is it real? Is it real that those who die in their sins apart from Jesus will pay for those sins forever in the lake of fire? I ask you, is there a hell? Is it real? Or is this whole thing a fairy tale? Because if it's a fairy tale, then I quit. I'm done. If all that is just baloney, then what is all this for? What's all the money that we put into making meals and sharing the gospel around the world? Why why should we support Kaylee in Indonesia? If there's no hell, then what are we doing? But if there's a hell, then don't we ought to be telling people about it? Shouldn't we tell people about Jesus if hell is real? Shouldn't we care that the person you sit next to at school it doesn't know Jesus? Shouldn't it matter? Shouldn't it matter the person you work with and you know they curse Jesus by the way they talk? You know it. Shouldn't it matter to you that they're going to end up in an eternal place of damnation is there a hell if there's a hell then let's tell people about Jesus if there's a hell then we got to quit bringing excuses big deal the rest of your friends aren't sharing the gospel you be faithful I don't know what to say we'll help you with that the one excuse I hope nobody in this church brings up is I don't care do we care? If there's a hell, then we got to care. We got to care. We got to care and we got to share. 
We're going to share the gospel of Jesus. Share it with our friends. Share it with our co-workers. Share it with the people you share your locker with. Let's share Jesus because there is a hell. And anybody who doesn't know Jesus will be lost in their sin forever. And there's no going back. There's no second chances after the grave. There is none. They got to hear about Jesus today in this life while they still have breath in their lungs. We got to tell them about Jesus. Is there a hell? Then we better tell people about Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me as we pray? Gracious Father, I wanted to apologize for getting emotional. But God, I don't apologize for that. When I read about the Apostle Paul in the scriptures, his heart was moved with passion when he walked into Athens, Greece 2,000 years ago. And the place was filled with idols. And people were lost in their sin. And the glory of God was not there. People were not giving him the glory that is due his name. And God, he got upset about it. And he didn't stand up and make a big fuss. He just started telling people about Jesus. God, you're not getting the glory that is due your name in Norwalk and Central Iowa. Lord, there's thousands of people that live here. They're blinded by humanism, materialism, consumerism, and every other ism that exists. You're not being glorified the way you deserve to be. You're not being worshipped the way you deserve to be, oh God. If you were this church, none of these seats would be empty here today. We'd have to have more multiple services filling this building, God. Oh God, may we ask you today to set our heart ablaze, to leave this place, and let's go out, God, and be witnesses for you. We know that not everybody's going to listen to us. Some people are going to think we're crazy. We're just mad. And they're going to walk away. Others are going to say, let me think about it for a while. But there's going to be others, Lord Jesus. There's going to be others like testimonies we've heard today who are ready to hear the gospel if we'll just tell them, oh God, may we be a witnessing church. May I be a witnessing pastor. May we have witnessing elders and witnessing deacons and witnessing youth leaders and witnessing young people for Jesus Christ. Oh God, may we be a church that knows that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And we're telling people about it because you are the only way. God, if there's a hell, and there is, then burn within us its reality that makes us and motivates us, God, to tell people about you. Lord, you've given us your word. We know how to do it. Lord, give us boldness, a fresh zeal, a fresh boldness like the Apostle Paul had, who, who alone stood and shared the gospel their heads bowed and their eyes closed this morning the Lord has spoken to your heart about maybe someone that you know that doesn't know Jesus and your heart is heavy today if the Lord has spoken to your heart about being a faithful witness about being a being on fire for the glory of God in your school where you work in this community I want us to come down together I want you to leave your seat and come and let's leave this at the throne of grace this morning let's take ourselves and our and and these things and bring them to the Lord this morning and pray about them in worship of God and ask him to help us be a witnessing church would you do that this morning if nothing else would you just come down and just pray that fellowship will become a witnessing church that we ought to be for the glory of God
God, that's our prayer. We can't do this, Lord. We can't do this. We can't do this without you. At the same time, you told us this is what you want us to do. And so, God, that's our prayer. Take me over. Take me over, Jesus, and take me now. All of me. God, every one of us in this room, none of us feels like we have it all together. None of us feels like we always have the right answers. We always, always have the right words to say to somebody. God, there's no experts in this room. But God, we humble ourselves this morning and we just say, oh God, please take us. Take our lives and use us feeble and humble. Take us and use us, God. And we will share the gospel of Jesus, Lord. If we'll just be faithful. If we'll just be faithful, God, you'll take that faithfulness and you'll use it, God. You'll bring people to you that nobody could do of even and own their own strength. You'll bring people to you, God, who've been lost in their sin for years and hard-hearted like, like Carolyn Robinson's dad. God, we thank you that today her father is on his way to heaven, Lord Jesus. His whole life, his whole life he lived apart from you. God, what a great example. God, you want to use us. We just got to be faithful. We just got to be faithful. Oh, Lord, I pray that you give us a burning passion for your glory. Thank God, you deserve to be honored. You deserve to be worshipped. You deserve to be glorified, but you're not. You're not. And so, God, if that's going to happen, I'm going to have to be faithful to share the gospel like Paul did. We're going to have to be faithful, God, to share the gospel. So, God, I just pray that we'll lay aside the excuses. No more excuses. If there really is a hell, no more excuses. It's time to get serious. It's time to get faithful. It's time to encourage one another in this room that we're going to do our best to share the gospel with people in Norwalk, Iowa, in Des Moines, Iowa, in Cumming, Iowa, in Carlisle, Iowa, and all around us, God. Wherever we live, wherever we work, wherever God has placed us. Oh, God. God, we want to be faithful. We don't want people that we know, even people that we don't know, have to stand before you at that great white throne judgment someday, and their name is not written in the Lamb's book of life. Oh God, let that not be. Let there be a faithful witness in Norwalk and Central Iowa, and let it be the witness of Fellowship Community Church. Lord, we love you this morning. God, I thank you for every prayer that's been prayed to you this morning and every heart that's here, whether down front or not, God. And we just pray that you'll take this church family and God, let us be an army marching forth with the gospel of Jesus that changes hearts and lives for your honor and glory. And if you would agree with me in this prayer, would you give a resounding amen? Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. You can be seated back at your seats. We are going to pray for our offering now. The ushers are going to come. <clears throat> Would you just join me as these are finding their seats? God, Lord, thank you for the opportunity to give. Lord, we just thank you for this time. It's been good, Lord. And I just pray that you'll take these tithes and offerings. Let us, let us reach out using every resource that you provide through your people, Father. With the glorious gospel of Jesus, I pray in your name. Amen. Anything you filled out, cards, inserts, etc., you can drop in the offering bags. Adam? All right, thank you. We want to say a warm welcome. Uh, if you are a guest here this morning at Fellowship, thank you for joining us and uh, worshiping with us. We're glad that you're here. Um, we encourage you to come back uh, next week uh, to be with us and worship with us again. Uh, on your way out this morning, if you want to grab a gift uh, we have for you out there at Grand Central, it looks like a, uh, it's a water bottle like that. So feel free to grab one of those if you are new, if you are a guest. So thank you uh, just for being here today. Tonight we have our senior high uh, youth ministry starts at 6 p.m. And our Sunshine Choir rehearsals also start um, at 6 p.m. as well. And uh, be aware that your sixth graders are uh, welcome to be a part of that if they would like to. Now, you have an insert in your worship folder. looks like this. Um, go ahead and snatch that out um, real quick. It's uh, about the Norwalk Christian Academy and uh, the registration night, which is coming up on uh, February 28th. Um, so you, if you are interested in uh, registering your child to be in the Norwalk Christian Academy, please uh, be aware of when that date is. And if you want 
further information about those kind of things, we have a table um, out there in the lobby uh, with a sign that says Norwalk Christian Academy above it. So stop there and get some more information. Uh, now, our last thing, uh, we have our new uh, fellowship app on uh, Android and iOS. So if you uh, don't have that yet, uh, I would encourage you to download that. Uh, it's got a lot of useful information, kind of just our website condensed into an app, essentially. We have our calendar of events on there. Anything, any, Anytime something's coming up, it'll be on there. It'll give you a notification if you set it to give you notifications. It's got the worship folder on there, a whole bunch of other things, too. So uh, feel free to check that out and to download that. Um, so let's stand, and uh, we'll close with a song. And thank you for being here today.